to thank and ask us all to, sh to add those thanks to all the work that Melissa Hartley has done to pull off this lecture series. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and we're very grateful for our hosts here at the JCC as well for making available this really nice space. And I want to thank all of y'all for coming out tonight on this cold, really wintry evening. And I see a number of you who have been to other lectures and plenty of you who haven't. So if you weren't at the other lectures, don't worry. I will make good on my promise to, to make sure that this is as accessible as possible without relying on the material in the previous two lectures. I will be making some use of what was in those previous two lectures. So if you were here, you will have some benefit from it. But where it's actually really important to follow what I'm going to say, I'm going to review it. Right? So I hope everyone is feeling feeling safe in where, wherever you all are at. Um, and so Melissa gave a great introduction to the program. So I will skip past the slides that I prepared, even though I knew she would do a great introduction to the Scientists in Synagogues program. And let me take a moment to just go through the summary slides from my first two lectures, just to put tonight's material in context. So um, when we first met at uh, Upstate Medical School a couple weeks ago, the topic was wonder. And uh, in particular, I wanted everyone who was present there to walk away knowing that wonder is a really important emotion in uh, science and in religion in just about any way that human beings respond to the natural world. Wonder seems to be a path that, that leads us there. Um, it's In my reading of Heschel, that's where I came to learn that wonder was really the entry level emotion for religious feeling and exploration in particular. He makes a really good point, a big point about um, how wonder is the first step in our pathway to, to God. Um, and he also makes clear that um, when we feel wonder, we may feel wonder at a beautiful night sky, at a wonderful uh, nature scene, at a gorgeous animal, but if we actually ponder it carefully, wonder at human capacity to know, to interact, to, uh, to find love, those sorts of things, are, that is actually the uh, set of phenomena, if we want to call them that, that are most uh, worthy and uh, deserving of wonder. Um, and I surprised myself in preparing that lecture to learn how many scientists, A, are willing to give credit to wonder in their own scientific work, but even some scientists who are better known for not their lack of friendship to religion, actually, when they come to talking about what excites their wonder most, sound awfully religious. And I will share with anyone who wasn't present uh, at the first lecture a wonderful quote from Feynman, where he basically confesses to what I would describe as religious feeling, even though he denies it's anything like the religion he was taught in Sunday school. So that was, um, oh, I should have called this lecture number two. That was lecture number one's um, uh, summary. When we met a week ago at Hillel, the subject was time. And um, I, I, I walked all of y'all who were here through two different aspects of time. There's time as we experience it uh, as human beings, anticipating, uh, met, remembering, uh, regretting, being proud, being worried, all these things about the past and the future and our progress through it. That's an experience of time uh, that can be called temporality. There's another aspect of time that ends up showing up in physics, and that's kind of a timeless form of time, time as a fourth dimension in which uh, uh, behavior can be described, but that doesn't seem to uh, pass 
or flow the way it feels like it to us in our ordinary human lives, and that goes by the name of eternity. And the dilemma for human beings who also respect science is that those two views of time, each in its own place, seems to be the correct view of time, seems to be describing the same phenomenon, and yet, and yet describing them in entirely different ways. And if you were present, you may remember um, how Abraham Joshua Heschel actually is able to find meaning in both polarities of, the, uh, of how time fits into the world. So that's the quick summary, but don't worry when I'm gonna use anything specific, I still promise to do a review. Now, here is a, an outline of what I'd like to do tonight. I will start right off with a review of one technique I'm bringing from physics for making diagrams of how things move, where things are as a function of time, the so-called space-time diagrams, because I'm gonna use a few space-time diagrams in my treatment of a few aspects of the physical universe. I'll first want to convince you of what I think is probably uh, the most common sense understanding of what the universe is, the universe as a collection of everything that exists, or uh, sometimes I like to take that same idea and dress it up and say the universe is the whole of which every other thing is a part. Okay. But in addition, I will want to convince you all that the universe is itself a physical thing. So it's both the set of all things and it is a thing in itself. And those will be my two twin, somewhat paradoxically twin ideas from physics. Then I'm going to move to a different kind of description of the world and I will be trying to convince you all that we should think of the world in the broadest sense of the term world as consisting both of a physical part that I like to call the world of things, and then a part that doesn't have that much to do with physics or even natural science in the ordinary sense, the world of persons, or as I like to call it, the world of aliveness. And they're both parts of the world, but they work so differently that I want us to be able to keep both ideas in our heads and compare and contrast them. And then, with all of that as background, I'm gonna walk you through an argument constructed by Abraham Joshua Heschel in the mid-1950s that I think is the most interesting, to me, persuasive argument to believe that God exists and has something to do with our lives. And it will call on all of the stuff that, uh, <coughs> uh, that I will have talked about before. Now, I want to say one other thing about how the, the, the next 45 or 50 minutes or so are gonna proceed. Unlike the previous two lectures, I'd like to ask people to hold questions to a few seams in the program. So I, what I'd like to do is talk about my physics ideas and then pause and take questions on the physics ideas. Then talk about this two different aspects of the world, the world of things, world of aliveness, and then when I've made my prepared remarks about that, pause and take y'all's questions on that, and then move through the argument that Heschel makes for, um, uh, for belief in God. So are we okay with those, those ground rules? Okay, great, thank you. All right, um, so a reminder, and maybe we can make this a little better, it's just gonna help. Okay, that makes it look a little pretty. Um, so, uh, we are talking about the world, and we're talking about the world both in terms of things that are part of our everyday existence, or maybe we wish our everyday existence was as beautiful as this pond with these wonderful trees and this rustic structure over there, but it's in a cosmic context. There's that beautiful view of the Milky Way. Uh, 
as well as some more nearby stars that are the nearest parts of the Milky Way. And that's a stand-in visually for everything beyond the Earth, including plenty of things that extend a lot farther beyond the Milky Way. So we're talking about, on the physical scale, the most intimate and the grandest, but also even outside the physical scale, as I'll be arguing, both the most intimate scale and the grandest scale as well. So now, here are a few slides of review if you were here last time, or quick introduction if you weren't here last time, for the kind of diagram that we call a space-time diagram. And I want to start here in this slide and say, maybe I want to make a diagram that best represents the motion of the Earth around the sun, where the, where the Earth is when. And I might do that by taking four frames of a movie, or a conceptual movie, of the sun, represented by this asterisk, sorry, represented by this asterisk, and the Earth on its more or less circular orbit. Should be able to do this. Here in January, then partway around in April, halfway around in July, three quarters of the way around in October, and then there's the next January that would look like this first frame. And most of us can picture, I think, that you could make any one of those diagrams, and if you had enough diagrams like that, individual snapshots of where the Earth is in its orbit, it's kind of like frames of a movie. Okay? Now, that's step one of constructing a space-time diagram. Step two is to stack all those frames in a third dimension, up and down, and let's represent the height that we place each individual diagram in that stack to correspond to the time at which that image is represented. So we've got January at the bottom, and then a certain way up on this time axis, we place the April image, another three months worth of time upward on this axis, we place July, another three months upward, we place October, sorry, and then we'd have another January and so on. Okay. Now, to complete a space-time diagram, imagine that in addition to those four frames, the Earth wasn't just at a spot on January 1st and nowhere until April 1st. There actually were a bunch of frames that we didn't sketch, but they're really there. So in a true full space-time diagram, we would have inserted something that represents where the Earth was around the sun at every date. And so the sun is here, here, here at later and later times. So we can connect, I'm sorry, we can connect all of the places where the sun was with that vertical line. And that line through this three-dimensional space-time diagram is representing the sun's location as a function of time. Higher is later, lower in the diagram is earlier, and we're describing the two, two of the three dimensions of space in the horizontal planes. Now the Earth's world line is more interesting because the Earth was going around in a more or less circular orbit, but if we make time be the third dimension, then that circular orbit is actually a helix. And so here is a helically shaped world line of the Earth. Okay? Now, that's all the review. Now, I didn't show this diagram before. This is actually a simplified space-time diagram of something, of, of, of something a little more simple than the Earth going around the sun. Here, I have not tried to use perspective to represent two spatial dimensions. I'm just going to let distance from left to right represent one spatial dimension, but I still want the vertical direction in this space-time diagram to represent time. So earlier time, later, 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 latest, moving upward. Now, what am I actually drawing here? 
have to put this down. Yes, I did catch it. All right, so what did you see? You saw a ball leave my hand, fly upward, slow, stop, fall down, fall faster and faster until I caught it. If I want, if I use the left-right coordinate in this diagram to represent the height of that ball as a function of time, then this curve labeled Roman numeral one, turned sideways, is not a bad representation of what that was. Left my hand at a high speed, kept getting higher and higher, but slowed. Was it moving up or down at the highest spot? And then came back down towards my hand faster and faster. And that's what that looks like uh, in a space-time diagram. Now, any way I would throw that ball would look something like that. It would leave my hand, get up slower, 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 stop at a maximum height, and then fall down. But if instead of using my hand to launch this ball, if we hired NASA to put this as the payload in a rocket, we could launch it upward with such a high speed that it would never fall down again. In fact, that's what we pay NASA to do with <laughs> stuff more interesting than balls. All right, but the basic idea of all that drama at Cape Canaveral is to give something a high enough speed so that it will not fall down again. Now, um, if you want to represent what NASA does with objects, we could show the world line of the payloads of NASA satellites by some of these other curves that have the property that they keep moving to the right. That is, in this diagram, upward more and higher and higher and higher as a function of time. And these are different versions of how fast you get something to fly away and never fall down. Okay. So this is a diagrammatic representation of what beginning physics students learn in, oh, I don't know, the fourth week of uh, college physics course. All right. So now, store that away. We are going to use the concepts of space-time diagrams in, precise, in just a few minutes. Now I want to get to this first question that I'm posing. What is the universe? And I want us to examine at least two different interpretations of the concept of universe. One is a set of every physical thing that exists, or in fancier language, the whole of which every other physical thing is a part. And, and then, after we discuss that idea a bit, I will try to convince you also of the second idea, namely that the universe is a physical thing itself, governed by its own laws of nature. So look forward to believing that in a minute. <laughs> All right. Now, here on the right is uh, another version of a space-time diagram that people who are present for lecture number two saw before. So this representation of a cube is another version of one of these two spatial dimensions, left, right, and into and out of the screen third dimension representing time. And this is a cubical segment of a much vaster space. And, and only, it only shows a finite interval of time as well, because the cube has a bottom and a top. And these squiggly lines in there represent world lines. And notice that they have a lower, lowest point and an upper point. And this particular one labels the lowest point with the word birth and the top point with the word death, suggesting that, in fact, these squiggly lines are supposed to represent world lines of individual people. 
who come into existence at a certain time, move around. Oh, when did you come to Syracuse? Oh, okay. <laughs> and, all right. And then uh, after, hopefully, many happy years, uh, the world line of that person ends. And it looks like one, two, five people's world lines are represented in this diagram. Uh, five out of many, many more. They're not all contemporaneous. These three people were born around the same time, overlapped a lot. This person might have been someone else's uh, parent or, or maybe grandparent. Okay, so um, that's a suggestion that there's lots of people in the world. How many billion now? Six, seven billion these days? Uh, say nothing of all the non-human objects just on our planet, then how many planets, stars, galaxies throughout the universe. It's a pretty big set of things when we talk about the set of everything, everybody, everywhere that exists. And sometimes we might even say not everything, not just everything that exists at any given time, but everything that exists throughout all time. So we're talking in this concept of the universe as a set of things. Or, if you look at that set all at once, okay, that's the most inclusive whole you can imagine. Whole, W-H-O-L-E. And apply that concept to this picture. So these things in the foreground represent the sorts of things that are at the human scale, but with the reminder that there's so, so many more of them in this vast universe of ours. Okay. Maybe that's the most common sense concept of the universe. But there's another point of view which I think we need to keep alongside of it, and it's one that we've learned since the early part of the 20th century to also carry with us. This is one of my favorite photographs in the history of science. This figure is very recognizable, right? That's Albert Einstein doing something he almost never did, look through the eyepiece of a telescope. He had a telescope in his head, but not one that he actually put his eye to. This person is very famous, but maybe we're not so familiar with pictures of him. That's Edwin Hubble. And this picture was taken on January 29th, 1931, when Einstein made a special visit to the Mount Wilson Observatory as Edwin Hubble's guest because Einstein had learned, as had the rest of the world, that uh, Hubble had just discovered that the universe was expanding, something that Einstein wished he had predicted and failed through a uncharacteristic lack of intellectual courage, uh, <laughs> failed to predict, and he felt really sheepish, but he was publicly going to see for himself how that was done. So he visited Hubble. Most astronomers may or may not recognize Hubble's face, but he always posed smoking a pipe. So <laughs> the astronomer smoking a pipe is, is Hubble. Um, so one way you can talk about the scientific synergy between these two scientists' work is that Hubble discovered that the universe was expanding but it was Einstein's theories, actually, that he had written down um, a decade and a half earlier that were the concepts that allowed us to understand what it meant to say that the universe was expanding. Um, so here is a more famous picture of Einstein. And really, it was starting in 1915 that he laid out the, um, the ideas that then could be brought to bear in 1929, when Hubble made, first made his announcement, 3031, and on to the present time. And this is, these ideas have both become part of the currency of science, but they are nevertheless um, uh, remarkably uncanny. And even today, getting your head around what it means to talk about an expanding universe it still makes most of us, sort of every once in a while, shake our heads. So, in order to explain what we do and don't understand about that, I'm gonna be showing you in the next few slides this schematic kind of space-time diagram. 
it's a space-time diagram in the sense that I've got a time axis moving upward in the diagram, and I've got a few snapshots of the thing I would like to show how it evolves in time. But in this case, I'm talking about the whole universe. I don't want just a little segment marked off by square boundaries to say, well, this is the arrangement of things in a part of space. What I'd like to be showing you here is something that, of course, it makes no sense in a diagram, but with the power of imagination, think that each of these symbols that's supposed to look like a balloon, each of those symbols is supposed to represent all of space at a certain instant of time. That's the idea behind this kind of space-time diagram. So, a balloon is representing two spatial dimensions in its surface. The inside of the balloon is not part of the story. Just imagine, just like we showed those two-dimensional sections of space with Earth going around the sun, this whole two-dimensional surface represents all of space, at least in two of its three dimensions. And we've got several versions uh, higher and higher up representing the universe at later and later times. And what you'll notice is that the balloon is bigger at higher in the diagram at later times. And this is a diagrammatic representation of this idea that space is expanding. And if you look in a little more detail, drawn on the surface of each of these balloons are a set of white symbols that I recognize as representing spiral galaxies. If you recognize them, great. If not, no big deal for this, for this talk. But you'll notice that those symbols aren't getting any bigger, but they're farther apart. Okay? So that's the basic idea of expansion. Now, just like in lecture two when I told you there's no way I'm explaining all of special relativity in a 15-minute segment of the lecture devoted to it, I'm surely not explaining all of relativistic cosmology in this lecture, but let's just carry this picture forward and see how far it gets. Now, do you remember this drawing? Mm -hmm. This one-dimensional space-time diagram from a few minutes ago. Now, with exactly the same curves, I'm going to relabel one axis instead of this axis representing the height of a ball after I throw it, I want that axis instead to represent the size of the universe at any given time. And don't worry too much about how big the universe is, whether it's you know, infinite. Just pick as a size marker the distance between any two galaxies. And that can be something that you measure as a function of time. And now, depending on what happened right at the Big Bang, this same shaped curve that in the previous version of the diagram represented a ball moving up and down, exactly the same shaped curve represents the whole history of a universe that starts with effectively zero size, expands, and then contracts and recombines into some very dense state that if it were to happen, we already have a name for it, we would call it the Big Crunch. Okay. Now, as it turns out, we don't think there will be a Big Crunch, but it could have been by some definition of could. Um, and these other curves that represent what NASA does with payloads, the same shape curves represent different possible histories of a universe that keeps expanding forever and never collapses down in a big crunch. And I find it absolutely amazing that whether I'm talking about a ball that I throw or the history of the entire universe, the same kind of graph lets me talk about either phenomenon. I find that astounding. And there's a lesson to that astoundingness. OK? 
Okay. If I can write down a simple equation that then lets me make a graph that's this simple and that easy to interpret, that describes the whole universe, then by some definition of the word thing, the universe is a thing. It's a physical system that I, as a physicist, can learn to analyze, can describe. Okay? It's not just some most abstract thing, the set of everything that exists. It's a thing. It's got properties, and those properties, we can learn the laws that govern them. We can find the history of those properties as they go through time. And in this sense, I claim the expanding universe is the grandest of all physical things. Okay. That's my claim. And at an appropriate moment coming up soon, I'll let you ask questions about that. But this is one of the most important arguments from this physics part of the lecture that I want you to at least hear and accept that I believe it, whether you accept it or not. Now, a few other things to make sure you understand how strange is this claim, because it is a claim about the whole universe. Right? I want to point out several things that you're not supposed to fall into, even though the diagram might tempt you to fall into thinking that way. Even though we're drawing these balloons representing the whole of space at different times, and we're because of the laws of drawings and optics and eyes, we're drawing them as seen from outside. There is no outside to the universe. Okay? So you're not supposed to picture there's any space outside the universe into which the expanding universe is expanding. It's just all of space, and it's getting bigger. And this is the way we know how to draw it. So that's pitfall number one to avoid. Pitfall number two to avoid, and this is, if anything, harder to get. Maybe there's another balloon down there that's really tiny, representing the universe right after the Big Bang. It's not drawn, but picture it. I could extend that time axis down below it, but I'd better not, because time started at the Big Bang. There's no time outside the universe, just as there's no space outside it. Okay? So these diagrams are handy for some things, but they tempt you into thinking things that, as far as we know, just aren't true. So these are my two favorite uncanny aspects of the universe. There is no background space into which that expanding universe is expanding, and there is no meaning to any time before the Big Bang. Don't even try to think of it. It's just wrong. <laughs> okay? And if there were a big crunch, there's no time afterwards either. Okay. And the, the reasoning behind this is that what came into being at the Big Bang was not just, not just a thing, but the thing that consists of all of space and all of time, or what we call space-time. So space-time, and in particular time, came into being at the Big Bang. And it makes sense afterwards, but the concept doesn't even make sense beforehand. Now, here's where it gets really weird, but it's really interesting to wrap your head around this. So I'm talking about space came into existence, and space and time representing the uh, the whole universe, which is the set of everything that exists. But space is also at the, all along, it is that which makes meaningful concepts of near and far. And time, even though I say it came into being, okay, it is still the basis of before and after. In other words, space and time have never lost their meaning as concepts of relationship. And yet, this set of the basis of relationships is a thing, a 
physical thing whose properties I can describe, whose dynamics I can explain, I can talk about and its age and whatever. So we have this bizarre feature of our universe that the most fundamental relationships among physical things is that set of all those relationships is itself a physical thing. Neat, huh? <laughs> so, the universe is the set of everything that exists, the whole of which everything is a part. It is also a physical thing, and it is also the basis of relationship between every other physical thing of which it's a part. Let's pause. <laughs> Maybe someone has some you questions they'd like to ask. I, I have some. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me. I'm wondering, I mean, what if we, there was something beyond what you're describing, but we just don't have the physics to describe what's not supposed to be seen as outside of the universe? Yeah, whatever we don't have physics to describe, we don't have a very good purchase on. So what you're hearing from me is the world as we understand it, as we think it is, uh -huh. but someone else giving a lecture 40 years from now might tell you a different story. I can't, I can't say no. Um, but if I, I'm here to represent what we think we understand, and this is what we understand. And there, no, there, as we understand it, there is no such thing as that external space. Sorry, it's the best I can do. Yeah, Wayne. Uh, I can't get my head around the idea of, of space as a thing by itself, because the universe is exponent, you know, is growing and growing and expanding into more space. So, mm -hmm. isn't space itself a thing? Space is a thing, thing, and that thing is expanding bigger. into, or mm -hmm. so there's a, yeah. is there more than one nope. universe? No, nope. no, nope. this is this is it. This is this okay. is space. This is it. Okay, it's just getting bigger. Okay, Mark, your first few diagrams. <clears throat> suggest that there's sort of a four-dimensional vector space out there, including yes. Yes. X, Y, Z, and time. X, Y, Z, and T, exactly. And, but you're also saying that the universe is not embedded in this four-dimensional vector space. No, the four-dimensional four four dimensional space describes where you are in the universe. Okay. It's got, are it's got three spatial dimensions, and it's different at every time, so you're right, four numbers. It's, a, it's okay, but the fact that we are using four numbers doesn't say that it's embedded. We're all stuck on the same thing, and I get it, okay? I, I get it, but um, we just have to re relax and say, well, maybe it could be true. Are yeah. galaxies themselves expanding? No, no. Any, anything in the universe that has its size determined by, by forces of attraction. So atoms aren't expanding. Galaxies aren't expanding, the solar system isn't expanding, the sun is not expanding, but everything is as if the, the things that hold themselves together hold themselves together, and the rest of it is being thrown apart. Yes? Um, uh, the, the universe is the set of everything that exists. How do you avoid the sorts of paradoxes that come from the set of all sets that don't contain those sets? Um, <laughs> oh, God. That's more sophisticated than I, than I can deal with. Maybe maybe later we can talk about that. Okay, I I hope I don't need to deal with that paradox, but I'm not sure. Yeah, very. Right. Uh, if the universe is expanding, there cannot be a crunch. You you uh, you you give the first the ball, the mm -hmm. push comes back, but this cannot be anymore. Oh, it surely could be. We don't think it is, but here's why it could be. What's the reason that? The ball falls down after I throw it up. Gravity. Gravity. Okay. All of the galaxies in the universe attract one another with a gravitational force. Now, it, the universe could have been set up with the creator having given every galaxy a wimpy enough push that gravity would slow it down, stop the expansion, and let everything recombine. It could have been. It doesn't appear to have been done that way, but it could have been. Lois. Very simple question. You said something about the, the uh, universe could collapse again 
When did it collapse before? Was that the good uh, okay. time? Okay, that's, that's bad language. It could collapse, it could become small again by collapse. Oh, okay. That's, that's what it meant. Okay. Yes, Mark. I'm having the hardest time um, <laughs> understanding time in the thing. Yeah. That's the, the belief that I yeah. suppose of a measurement of. Mm -hmm. Because you know, it is it. this system of relationships of before and after and how long after. It is that. But we also have been able to see that time slows down in gravitational fields, that uh, the, the time that elapses for someone who goes on a very fast round trip is less time than someone who stayed behind at the, at the departure point. So time does have properties and behavior, even though it's also a set of relationships. It's okay to have trouble wrapping your head around it, but it turns out to be true. Okay, maybe two more questions and then we'll move on to the next thing. Uh, Sherry. Uh, why is that important? Why is that important? Let's hold that question, and if it, I haven't made it clear by the end of the lecture, ask me again. Mark. You said galaxies do act on each other. Like yes. That. So you take a pair of galaxies, mm -hmm. and the distance between them is increasing. Yes. But the galaxies themselves are not. Right. Yes. And what about the force between them? Is yes. Decreasing. Ordinary gravitational force, the so way we would decreasing. do, and you know, we would approximate very accurately with Newton's law. If we had to be really, really good, we'd use general relativity. But it's it's regular gal, it's regular gravity. Um, all right. Are they urgent, or should we move Just on? Move on. Move on. Okay. I will still be here. I will stay as late as anyone wants to <laughs> answer the other questions. Okay. All right. So we did some physics. Now, I'm gonna step outside what I would teach with the authority of a physics professor at Syracuse University and talk with, in different language, but it's language I still believe, only I'm not a professional expert on what's gonna come afterwards. Okay, so everything we've been talking about up until now, I'm talking about the physical aspect of a world of universe. But I want us to think not only about the physical universe, but the world of people like me and you and everyone else in the room and all our friends and relations. People who observe the world, who participate in it, who act on it, who have thoughts, feelings, desires. And the, the claim I'm making is that the way human beings, the way persons, live personal lives is so different from the way physical things obey physical laws that I want us to imagine that this world in which we live really needs two separate sets of descriptive concepts. When we aren't engaged in describing people and their lives, we can use the tools of natural science, and we're talking about the world of things. But if we want, as I will argue more, this is just the preview summary, if we really want to talk about what it means to be a human being living in the world, there's a whole other set of concepts that I'm gonna call the world of aliveness. And somehow they must interdigitate and work with each other because we live our lives as people who are embodied in physical bodies, but everything else about our lives seems really, really different from the physical world. So, um, the world of things is what I almost always talk about as a professional physicist, and it's what I've been talking about up until now. It's stuff where forces cause things to accelerate, and chem you know, the chemical properties of one atom causes it to combine with another. We've got lots of laws of nature, a deep understanding of how things that don't have stuff going on in their heads, how they behave. And for everything like this, physics, chemistry, biology, you name it, 
they were great. Science is wonderful. It works. Now, before we get to Heschel, I will mention one or two other of my favorite people. Here is one of my favorite thinkers who I have not mentioned in the previous two lectures. I can't believe we got all the way to lecture three before Marilyn Robinson, Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, but also a really fabulous thinker and her thinking as opposed to storytelling, she expresses in some really wonderful essays. Um, she wrote this pretty remarkable sentence. And it's source one on your source sheet, if it's easier for you to look in your lap. Um, she wrote, it may have been perverse of destiny to array perception across billions of subjectivities, i.e. persons, but the fact is central to human life and language and culture and no philosophy or cognitive science, or she could have said natural science, should be allowed to evade that fact. So in this sentence, she's saying something that is either the most obvious common sense truth about the world, or in other contexts, she has to feel a little bit brave to insist that even when we are being a scientist, and I don't know why she's picking on neuroscientists, but she is, or a philosopher, or other kinds of scientists, sometimes people are in fact tempted to say, well, the world just works according to laws of nature, and if you think people are any different, you're ignoring the fact that we're just deterministic machines. She's claiming the opposite. We are not machines. Our existence is not exhausted by the laws of nature even governing our, our brains. And this sentence of Marilyn Robinson's is for me my theme sentence for the claim that I'd like to make that our experience uh, as human beings is characterized by a whole list of things that science doesn't get, period. Consciousness, desire, choice, action, goals, disappointment, satisfaction, perseverance, aspiration, despair, I mean the list could go on and on and on, and I don't see any possibility that the neuroscience of today or 10 years from now or 100 or 1,000 years from now is going to explain it. It's not even that explanation is what it's about. We are aspiring, we are doing as free, not robotically determined, but actual choosers, actual actors. Okay? And this is the difference between persons and physical things. And as persons, we have our experience, we try to, we have freedom to choose, we have freedom to make mistakes, we do it all the time, but even our judgment of our choices, you can't judge them according to physical laws, right? We're judging them by standards that are at an entirely different level entirely from um, from the kind of language that's appropriate to a scientific description of the world. And for those of you who are at the second lecture, the one on time, uh, it's only at the level of persons that this idea of time as something that flows comes into our description. Because that picture has no role in, in natural science. Now, I want to hark back, those of you who are at lecture one, I talked about this fabulous 20th century thinker, Hans Jonas, and I want to remind those who can benefit from reminding and teach quickly those who need to be taught tonight about uh, how Jonas uh, gave us language for understanding that something is higher than something else, not higher meaning three meters above the floor instead of two meters of the, above the floor, but higher in a more uh, abstract or exalted sense. And here is a sentence that you have on your source sheet. It was also on the source sheet in lecture number one. This is Jonas saying, the manifold 
of existing life presents itself as an ascending scale in which are placed sophistications of form, the lure of sense, the spur of desire, the command of limb, powers to act, the reflection of consciousness, and the reach for truth. An ascending scale, and everything here, except perhaps the concept of form, is something that's outside a physical description of living things, and it has to do with the experience of being alive. And he calls this an ascending scale, and so I've taken all those terms, and I've written them in an ascending scale where a sentence begins at the bottom. So sophistication of form, lure of sense, spur of desire, command of live, powers to act, reflection of consciousness, and reach for truth. Every living thing is a pretty sophisticated thing from the point of view of its form, either its phys both its physical form and the chemical magic that makes that uh, living thing alive. But then as we go up and up and up in this list of powers, we have things that fewer and fewer living things have finally up here at the top of Jonas's ascending scale are powers that really, as far as we know, only human beings have. And Jonas was trying to make a point about the philosophy of biology. That's what he devoted his life to. But you can also uh, take this as preparatory for the kind of thinking that in a moment I will remind you Heschel invited us to make, namely to ask the question of everything that's amazing about existence, what's the most amazing thing of all those amazing things? And it's precisely the things that are at the top of Jonas's ascending scale. So now bringing this back to this concept that I'm trying to pitch tonight about thinking of existence as having these two aspects, the world of things and the world of aliveness, I want to, uh, using the concepts that we just learned or relearned from Hans Jonas, insist that the world of aliveness is higher. By that definition of height, higher, more deserving of wonder and awe, more powerful in the way that persons can have powers than the world of things. But even though I'm going to, for the rest of our time together, keep talking about the world of things and the world of aliveness, I am talking about one world. But we already know that we live in kind of a rich world and subtle world, right? Because we have experience, both for good and ill, of being in, you know, associated, our lives are very much associated with these physical bodies that obey the physical laws of nature, and yet we live our lives of striving in the world of aliveness as well. So we're already used to two aspects of the one world in which we live. But just to be clear, I'm not trying to be a dualist. I'm trying to describe one world. That's just interesting enough to have these two aspects. All right, so this is a natural scene where I'm open to questions about this concept of two aspects of sharing. So how do they influence each other? Ah, good question. Right. Well, how do they influence each other in our own lives? I mean, if the world, if the universe is expanding, let's yes. say, is there some uh, some aspect of the aliveness that has, you know, that would be influencing that? Influencing the expanding universe? I don't see it there but I do see it in my life and I presume you in your life as well, right? I mean, you wake up in the morning, drag yourself out of bed, that first action is pretty much a physical action, but you're doing it because you've got stuff to do that day, okay? So the stuff you've got to do that day no, is mean, the I mean, world of aliveness, and, but you're doing it chained to this physical thing. But, but what I'm I mean, I, what, I, what I'm saying is like uh, the the world, the 
world, there may be other worlds in the universe. You know, maybe this sense of aliveness has something to do with the fact that uh, I'm not just talking about me as just as an yeah. individual. I'm okay. talking about human beings and maybe mm -hmm. things that are alive in this world. Yeah. And, and maybe there are things in other worlds, other worlds in the universe I mean, like that other are alive. Plants. Yeah, could be. And maybe, maybe they're influencing the expansion. Okay. That that last thought doesn't appeal to me very much, although I could be wrong. But so I would rather that you focus your thinking about this very interesting question you raise about the interaction between the world of things and the world of aliveness, the way we all confront it in our in our daily lives. Okay. All right. Mark? Isn't the notion of a thing almost a linguistic concept in that, for example, you have a 300 year old ask, axe that's had 10 new heads and 40 new halves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and each yeah. of those is a thing. Yeah. Or you have the bacterium, which is a thing, it's, it's yeah. inside a mouse's gut, right. and so it's a sub thing right. of the mouse. Okay. And so, right. on. so I'm not pretending to solve every philosophical <laughs> problem that there is. <laughs> And, all right, I mean, many, many smarter people than I have tried to do that. But I do think that even though there's all sorts of subtleties about naming and things, um, it's not important for this purpose. What I mean by the world of things is that aspect of existence where laws of nature exhaust what's interesting to say about. And for the, for the aspect of existence where the laws of nature don't exhaust what there is to say, that's because we are free beings with free choice. Okay. So we don't have to, to understand everything Kripke said in naming and identity. Right? We can Who's leave that for someone else. Someone who has got famous for solving all those subtle problems you mentioned about. But, uh, Okay. The uh, distinction yeah. of things. Yes, really. Oh, what, and the fact that we think we see things, could that be one of our chemical bases or interaction with neurons? Like you that? are far from alone in proposing that thinking is explained by biochemistry. Now, I would be the last person to stand up here and deny that biochemistry had anything to do with thinking. But Here's the distinction that I want to make. You can be the best neurobiologist, neurochemist in the world, and you can say that if I inject into this nerve cell this compound, then it will fire. And if I do that in some particular part of someone's brain, they will taste salty. I don't know. Okay? <laughs> but, and that all may be true, but I have never heard anything from neuroscience or biochemistry or whatever explain what it means, what it feels to be like inside this thinking thing. And that's what Marilyn Robinson meant when she said there's all these subjectivities in the world. There's another famous philosopher that I sometimes quote, but I don't have a slide from him, Thomas Nagel. He wrote a famous article called, What is it like to be a bat? And he pointed out it's almost impossible for human beings to picture the experience of being a bat. <laughs> its sensory apparatus is completely different, its goals are completely different, its life cycle is completely different. Now, probably it's very similar biochemistry that describes a bat's brain and our brain. But that's the, that's the aspect of consciousness that you could probe from outside. But we all have this interior experience of being conscious, and it doesn't even map onto, oh, this chemical was doing this thing, or this voltage you know, grew by this amount. They are in different worlds. And that's maybe the most interesting boundary between the world of things and the world of aliveness, because yeah, we've got all sorts of evidence that the part of our physical existence that is associated with what I'm calling the feeling of being alive is our brains, and we know a fair amount about how brains work, but none of that gets you into, inside your head. None of that gets you watching the TV on the 
screens of your retina. Okay? It's really a completely separate set of concepts. Uh, could it be that we have that subjective experience and that feeling of being alive that's really separate from the physical world, but that that doesn't have an influence on the actions of our body? So when you get up out of bed, it feels like you're doing it because you have yes. things you want to do. But, mm -hmm. but the, your actions, even yes. though there is this real separate thing, your action, right. it doesn't determine your actions. Right. So you're in good company. I believe that Spinoza had a view very much like that. Um, I don't know. To me, it seems absurd. I'm sorry to say, OK, that doesn't prove it's wrong, but it seems absurd, right? Because if, if you take that point of view, as Spinoza did, then you're actually denying that you are have any freedom, that your choices have any meaning. You just say, I'm a robot with somebody along for the ride. Okay? I hope the world isn't like that, right? But I can't prove it to you tonight, that's, that's for sure. Yeah. In the world of aliveness, uh, I saw two there is an extension on the individual basis. Expands own, metaphorically, grows, in, changes. In own yes. yes. But it's on the individual basis, not on the. Right, right. So there's a poetic basis. parallel, but not a very specific one. Yeah, yeah that's very nice. Okay. One more, and then I'll move on to part so three. So, is there any way that if we, let's say we don't want the universe to keep expanding? We don't just <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say we don't find the universe. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, what do we do about it? Um, you know, well, how of can, all can the we, things that would be difficult to change in the world, that seems like the most hopeless <laughs> case. All right, here's the one thing you could do. Get really, really, really fat. Become <laughs> so massive that your gravity attracts all the distant galaxies. That's the only thing I can do. <laughs> okay? So if, if this is important to you, get going. No, I, no. I, just, wonder, I, I just wonder I, I was just wondering if the science the physics the physicists that you that you study and yeah. everything, do they do they say they don't they, they think it's bad that the universe is expanding? No, I, all right. Just, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It just is, I know it just is, but is yeah. is that a bad thing? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, let me move on to the third and final part of my talk. Okay. All right, and now I'm going to get to my um, theological hero, Abraham Joshua Heschel. If anyone has been to either of the previous two lectures, you've heard me talk about him, or if you've ever talked to me about anything, you've probably heard me talk about Heschel. Uh, he was most active in the mid-1950s. That's when he wrote his three most famous books. The Sabbath, Man is Not Alone, and God in Search of Man. Put in your own words in place of man, as we would have written it today instead of in the 50s. Um, the most interesting thing about those books, and there's many, many interesting things about those books, if, if you, like me, were at a stage in your life where you were trying to understand what the world is like, does God exist, does Judaism have anything worthwhile to say about any big questions, Heschel, could be your person. Okay? The most interesting thing he did in my reading is to actually try to construct reasons and share with you reasons to believe that you can understand the world a lot better by believing that God exists than what we normally imbibe from the general secular culture of the world that science has got. So making God's reality vivid to readers who were brought up in modernity was, was, I think, Heschel's avowed goal, and I think he did it really well. So what I'm going to describe in the next few minutes is an argument by analogy that Heschel presents that just left me, when I finally understood it, dumbfounded and said, you know what? I think I was wrong for 40 or 50 years of my life thinking that science had it, and now I think that a picture of 
of, the, of a world where God is a major part of it. I shouldn't even say the word part. Where God is the basis of the world makes a lot more sense to me. So the reality of God and also the priority of moral law as opposed to natural law in the existence of the universe. And the reason I took us on this detour through the two aspects, as I call it, is because the argument that Heschel makes uh, relies on being able to split the world into these two aspects. So that's the preview. Okay, here is the first step in Heschel's argument by analogy. He says, tell me about a tree. Can you understand a single tree? And once you start to think of it, you realize, no, you can't understand any tree as just an isolated object. It makes no sense unless you see it in its context. Tree is next to other trees in a forest. That forest is on the surface of the earth. That earth has conditions that it has because of its distance from the sun. The sun has the properties that it has of shedding light and, um, uh, because of its history, how it was formed, how it was made up of materials from earlier in the history of the universe. That tree, you know, grew from a seed, what made the seed, previous generations of trees. On and on, that tree has nothing interesting about it that you can understand unless you're putting it in a context, a spatial context, a temporal context, um, uh, the context of the whole physical universe. And then, here's something that may seem like a non sequitur, but hold this thought, because it's going to be really important in just a minute, and that is this context, this whole context that we call the universe, is itself a physical thing with physical properties, while at the same time being the whole of which this tree is one very small part. And here's this particular idea that I've underlined so that you maybe will have it in mind when I come back to want to use it in a couple slides. The part, namely the tree, and the whole, namely the universe, are both physical. They have the same kinds of attributes that make each understandable in terms of the other. The universe is a physical thing because it's made up of other smaller physical things. The parts of the universe are understandable only in the context of this physical context. And now, because it's an argument by, an anal by analogy, remember what an analogy is. By the end of my presentation of this argument, I'm going to say a sentence that will sound like, D is to C as B is to A. I didn't hear that. D is to C as B is to A. Oh, okay. All right. So I'm going to set that up. We need four things, D, C, B, and A. Here is a table with four entries. And I filled in two of them so far. And I've labeled what rows and columns mean partly. So we talked about material objects only make sense in a physical context that we call the physical universe. So this is going to be B and A. And so this row, I'm going to call the physical row of the analogy. And I haven't filled in everything, so it's OK if you don't see where it's going yet. But I've got two columns, part and whole. The t any individual material object, tree, rock, whatever, atom, is a part of this whole that we call the physical universe. OK. So we hold this thought. We'll come back. I won't let this go away. But now we've got this whole other aspect of existence, namely the world of alliance. It's got all these billions of persons just on our planet that we know, and who knows whether there are other persons on other planets, we don't know. But persons work really differently. The interesting things about persons aren't, I'm sorry to say, the laws of biochemistry. They are the laws that govern how we make our choices as persons. So. If we want to be true to our nature of persons, we have to ask, should we be posing a similar question about persons as Heschel first posed about a tree? Can you understand a single person? 
And the answer is, at least according to Heschel, and he convinced me, the answer is no, you can't understand a single person at all. You only understand who a person is in relationship to other persons, to the whole of society, to history, to that person's parents, to everyone that that person loves, to everyone who has an influence on that person, to what that person's goals are for posterity. <clears throat> so you just as you only understand a tree in its physical context, <coughs> you only understand a person in the vastest possible context of persons, that is to say, the world of alliance. And now, here, in sentence form, and I'll put it in tabular form soon enough, here is the argument by analogy in full. Just as the set of relations between all physical things is itself a physical thing, that is to say, the universe, the physical universe, so too, here's the other side of the analogy, the set of relations between all persons must have a personal character. So, there should be, by analogy to the existence of the physical universe in which we understand objects, there should be something, and I've coined this horrible phrase, the personal whole, <laughs> within whom individual persons relate to one another. So, let's do the whole analogy in tabular form. Just as material objects only make sense in the context of a physical universe, so too at the personal level only do persons, conscious beings, they only make sense in terms of the context of personhood or a personal whole. That's an analogy, and I think the analogy formally makes some sense, but whether it's persuasive, okay? Arguments by analogy always rest on persuasiveness and not formal structure, okay? So, let's talk about whether the concept of law applies to uh, the two aspects. Well, there are laws of nature, laws of physics, laws of chemistry and biology that uh, govern the world of things. And when we say law, we mean law in a much more strict sense than any law that Congress passes or the Common Council passes. Things obey those laws. If we, got, if we had, know the laws correctly, things just do that stuff. No exceptions. That's just the pattern of the world. Now, what kind of law applies to persons? Surely, we aren't robotically constrained to obey every law passed by the Common Council or by Congress or promulgated by the United Nations or <clears throat> proposed by any of our sacred texts. We have this set of moral laws that are, are enjoined upon us by our society, our parents, whatever, throughout all of history somehow modifies it. So in some sense, this context of personhood, this personal whole, enjoins us to make the choice to obey moral laws. But there's no guarantee, as we know all too well in our own lives and the lives of everyone else, that there's no guarantee that we will obey them. These are pleads. These are not things that brook no exception. And all of our actions are aimed at achieving something. Unlike laws of nature, where if I tell you the way things were at some precise moment in the past, I tell you precisely what they were, I can predict the future. So from the past to the present, Moral laws are, I have a goal I want to achieve. I want to uh, make everyone around me happy. And then I try to make that happen. So it's goal-oriented, not causal. It moves from the present to the future, not from the past to the present. So 
when we try to actually think what this concept of a personal home, I'm almost done. Um, yeah. Um, what are the what are the at attributes of this personal whole? I want to now make one last step that Heschel was definitely making and say, you know what? What's really the personal parallel to what we call the universe of physical things is God. The personal whole is what sets the moral standards by which we try to live. The personal whole knows it's personal, just like the physical universe is physical, the context of all personality is personal, knows that it's going to be, he or she is going to be disappointed, but is enjoining us to try again and again. And I want to assert, even at this abstract level, this is a functional description of God, and Heschel definitely wants you to make the leap from context of personality to these properties and, um, and to, to see in that block in the diagram that we should actually fill in the word God as the higher counterpart of the physical universe. And here is Hethel, Heschel's most pithy description of his cosmology, his description of what the world really is. He says in these nine most amazing words, the world consists not of things, but of tasks. And you might ask, what tasks is the world made of? How about this task? Love your neighbor as yourself. Or love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Or love God and God's image with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. So this is the lesson that Heschel is bringing to us. And I invite your questions. And thank you for your patience. This one. No, this is ours. We got it. This, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. They, Leonard Bernstein once said, Everyone steals. The trick is to make good steals. So it's a good steal. Okay, so you started out by um, saying that the personal whole was the. Uh, Every person who is alive, whoever lived, whoever will live, that's what the personal whole is. Well, and that's the description like the uni physical universe is the set of all physical things. Right. So people are God. No. No, 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 no. No, Consciousness people are individual God? persons. Yes, but okay. if you combine everybody together, okay. that's what God is? But remember what we learned about the universe. Thank you. This is the perfect, perfect question. Thanks. Okay. Oh, you're welcome. Anytime. Okay. All right. Remember that the physical universe, at one level that you describe it, is the set of everything. Thing. But it is also a thing. thing. We have this end, this thing we're trying to get our hands around, that is the set of all persons, but it's also personal. Universal. Consciousness? Uh, well, you know, we have to start working on it. Yeah. Okay, we have to start figuring out what it means. All right, and this argument is only an invitation to ask these questions. It's too concise to actually be an answer to any of those good questions, but it should be an invitation. Yeah, to ask exactly, exactly that. But use the stuff that that we talked about when we were talking about the physical universe as a resource, okay? Mm -hmm. The universe is the set of all things. It's the whole of which everything is a part. It is itself a physical thing. It is also the, the context in which relationships make sense, okay? Mm -hmm. So there probably ought to be parallels to at least those three different levels of description of the physical universe in 
this other side in this world of aliveness. So, so yeah. what you were proposing is one of those three. That, that's just, okay, that's the first half of my question. Okay, good, So good, then, good. if that's what the personal whole is, yes. when we say God created the universe, it doesn't seem like that is part of that equation. Yeah, right. So, so when the Big Bang happened, when the universe came into being yeah. and consciousness came in, 